early on with my research at the moment, so please bear in mind that any findings that I'm looking at are preliminary findings and further data will be collected. Okay, so defining cyberbullying then. Um, in general, it's a relatively recent area of research. Um, if we look back, it was start, the term itself was starting to be used from about 13 years ago. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of um, cyberbullying in the media at the moment, so a lot of cause for concern. Um, and as such, there's now a rapid increase in the amount of research in this area. Um, because of the importance of it and certain perceptions about it, so far it's tend to focus on adolescents and child victims of perpetrators, rather than the possibility of adult perpetration and adult victimisation. But from anecdotal evidence, we do know that it is occurring in adult populations. Currently, the definitions include elements such as use of communication technologies in the internet, the purposeful intent to cause others harm, aggression, which hopefully is an obvious one, um, some kind of repetitive element, and power imbalance. Now, the reason these are asterisks is because currently lots of different definitions are used throughout the research. All of them use the element of technology, of intent to cause harm and aggression. The majority of them look at this element of repetition and power imbalance, but not all of them. Okay, so that's why I've asterisked them there. Having said that, there's a lot of debate in the area over what should actually be included in the definitions. Mainly, the three we see as central, which is intention, repetition and power imbalance. And those three key elements have stemmed from the definition of traditional bullying. Um, the reason that we have this debate is that it's whether these definitions can be applied from offline to the online world. So if we're looking at intention, how does that intention translate to the victim? If we're looking at the idea that perhaps um, social cues are reduced less online, that there's the possibility of um, misinterpreting information that perhaps is higher online, is it the intention that we should be focusing on, on that aggression? Or should it be the idea that someone identifies themselves as a victim, that they feel that they are being aggressed towards? Repetition is other, also an interesting because with offline bullying, it's only classed as bullying if there's this element of repetition. However, online, certain aspects such as the ability to share statuses on Facebook, to forward pictures and the mass audience, means that one particular incident might be considered as repetition by the victim. Equally, the victim could ruminate on that by checking and rechecking an email that perhaps has a negative message in it. And power imbalance too. So normally offline we look at power imbalance in terms of perhaps physical strength or authority. Okay? Online that might be more diminished. So certain elements of power might be less salient or otherwise there might be other elements <coughs> of power that take over. So for instance the actual ability to use these technologies, people's self-efficacy for technology. On top of that, there's another, um, there's lots more additional considerations that are perhaps unique to bullying through the use of technology. And they include things such as anonymity, the lack of social cues, the role of the bystander, the breadth of the audience, and the inescapable nature of it. So in offline bullying, perhaps if we take the, in the playground, once you leave the school ground, you are removed from that situation. With cyberbullying, we have this notion that it follows you home. So you bring it into your home through your computer, through your mobile device, and that perhaps that then has further impact because of this powerlessness that it creates to it, and also the fact that it's constantly there. So currently, the um, definitions that we're using for cyberbullying 
don't tend to include these kind of aspects directly in the definitions. And furthermore, in terms of my area and looking at cyber psychology in the workplace, uh, cyberbullying in the workplace, there's no real discussion about how this might occur. Okay, so there's some differences between how we look at bullying and workplace bullying or organisational bullying, but this hasn't yet really been picked up in the literature in terms of bullying by electronic means. So where does this leave us? It's important to look at these issues because it, we already know that cyberbullying for the victim leads to psychosocial problems such as depression, social anxiety, and low levels of self-esteem. In addition, we get negative emotional impacts such as sadness, hopelessness, and anger, frustration, vulnerability, and fearfulness. The reason I've highlighted frustration there is that frustration is actually seen as one of the potential factors that could cause antisocial behaviours such as cyberbullying. So if cyberbullying is causing anger and frustration, there's the potential that being a victim could then lead to further perpetration by that individual. So we're getting somewhat of a cyclical approach. In extreme cases, as we've seen in the media, there's the idea that it might actually lead to suicide. In the workplace specifically, very early research has been associated with lower performance, intention to leave, dissatisfaction, and anxiety. So again, we see that there's this real need to understand and then ultimately reduce the idea of cyberbullying, both generally and in the workplace. As I've said, currently there's a myriad of definitions for cyberbullying and that results then in a range of different measures for it. Almost all of these measures are based on research conducted and adapted from traditional bullying. And as we've seen, the definition doesn't necessarily transfer online. So why should the measures then be able to transfer online too? The use of the varying definitions in the measures has been thought to explain the vast differences in prevalence rates that we've seen which stem in adolescents from 10% to 72% experience it. And in the very early research in terms of workplace cyberbullying, from 9% to 21%. So there's this real need for us to pin down what exactly is cyberbullying and how can we measure it. And that's why my research starts to come in. So the main aims of the current research that I'm conducting is to understand the layman's perceptions of what constitutes cyberbullying. So the people who are experiencing it, who are potentially the perpetrators of this, what do they think cyberbullying is? How should it be defined? And what behaviours constitute cyberbullying? I'm using this as a stepping stone to try and form an operational definition which fits with the user's perceptions of cyberbullying. So in other words, the people who are using this technology rather than those who are researching its social impact. All of this is being used as somewhat of a grounded approach to develop tools for accurate measurement of cyberbullying in an adult working sample. And that, where it sounds a lot, is the initial stage of my research. Once I've developed those tools, I want to actually use those to explore potential factors which may contribute to perpetration and again, it's adult perpetration and the potential for workplace perpetration as well. To do this, I'm using a range of stages, and including telephone interviews, online focus groups, the development and testing of the tools which will stem from this, and a large-scale questionnaire study. So I'm in the initial phases at the moment of the telephone interviews. Um, I'm trying to use an iterative approach. So I collected my first 10 interviews, I'm going to go back, broaden the sample, look at the themes that are beginning to stem from that and see, feed those back to my further participants to see what do you think of this? Is it a common occurrence that people are perceiving it in this way? So, as I said, 10 telephone interviews, currently them all male office workers who use email on a daily basis as part of their job role and they were recruited by email and I've used thematic analysis for this. 
as I've said, further data to be collated um, and a more broad sample. So I'm just going to look for the most part in terms of how they've defined cyberbullying to begin with. Okay? So one of the clear things that people said kind of gave us, well, isn't it a bit obvious? It's the same as traditional bullying, but they're just using the internet or they're just using phones. Which, while it might seem obvious and logical, it's important to actually have the research to back that up, hence why I'm doing this. Okay? So they said things such as bullying using, moder uh, bullying using modern technology like Skype, Facebook and Twitter, or while presumably it's bullying via the internet or via social media, that sort of thing. Okay? But there wasn't necessarily a definition of what bullying was. There was this assumption that everyone knows what bullying is and we're just doing that online. What interestingly came up, which isn't necessarily part of the definitions for, um, that are used in traditional or cyberbullying yet, is the idea of manipulating behaviour. And this came across very strongly in quite the majority of the interviews. So one of the clear behaviours that they said was, well, cyberbullying is getting someone to do something or say something that they wouldn't normally do. So it's the idea that it's not just affecting them emotionally, but it's actually changing their behaviour. Okay? And it's possible, obviously as I said, very tentative, but it's possible that that's because we were looking at it in, uh, the emphasis was placed on workplace cyberbullying. So perhaps it's being used as a tool to change people's behaviour, to get things done in the workplace. What also came across was this idea of belittling or demeaning someone. So not just saying bad things about them, but putting them down, making them feel small. There was an emphasis on the textual nature of it. So in terms of the research currently in cyberbullying, we think of sending emails, texts, but we also include things such as images, videos. Okay? The participants didn't really refer to that, except in one instance, and they then clarified that saying and images as being more impact, so having more harm. Okay? There was also a presumption throughout the data that it mostly occurs on social media. So obviously there's the bullying on social networks and things. And it seemed to be tied to the opportunity as well. So there were more people on there, they were used more frequently, and therefore it happens there the most. So the idea that it's not necessarily stemming from the individuals themselves, but that it's being used as a tool. So the implication of the cyberbullying also is that it's not necessarily clarified by the intention. It's actually by the interpretation of the victim. So they didn't put the emphasis necessarily on they're doing the cyberbully is doing this for this reason said the victim interprets it. Okay? There was also somewhat of an implied distinction between the workplace cyberbullying and external cyberbullying as being motivated by different aspects, but that's something that I want to explore further. It didn't really come out as clear, and I'll be questioning that further. Um, but it involves different behaviours, so the workplace is very much role-related to get people to do things, whereas the non-workplace cyberbullying um, was more perhaps because you didn't like people or it was used for different reasons. There was some indication of repetition, but not that it was necessarily needed, and that it doesn't necessitate a power imbalance, which they felt was needed offline. So things for me to further explore that seem to be coming up is the aspect of perceived anonymity the fact that people think because they're anonymous there are also less consequences and they feel safe because of some barrier between them and the person. Also the fact that aspects such as reduced social cues might make people react in a way that unintentionally cyberbullies people. What came out as interesting was the fact that they felt a need to respond quickly. So from other talks we've heard about the fact that because we're online we can present, we can take more time over the 
but actually they felt there was a pressure that these communications necessitated you respond quickly, you're under pressure, and that this might make people act in a way that they didn't necessarily do. And also, some emphasis on the naivety of the victim. There's also an element to the motivation, so things such as pressure, it was born from frustration, for personal gain, so perhaps monetary, that it was being used as an excuse for certain things, that it stems for cyberbullies and insecurities, and also that there's an innateness to it. So there's a very small, and it was emphasized that it was rare, but there's a small number of people in the world that no matter what's happening, they're bad people and they are gonna do this. And they're just using it as further opportunity for that. Um, I'm aware that I've pretty much run out of time. Um, so just to say that interestingly, these motivations that people were talking about for bullying actually match up with some of the theories that we have um, in the research in other areas in terms of workplace bullying offline, including general strain theory, so people under pressure then work in negative ways, cues filtered out theory, so it's more in uninhibited online, the idea of de-individuation and instrumental aggression, so using aggression to get things. So it's quite interesting that lay people's perceptions are actually matching up with our current theories, but they all need to be gone back and explored.